You're listening to the Empowering Process Podcast with your host, Gail Kraft. Listen as she holds frank discussions around how your purpose, being present, and trusting your power impacts your life. Whether you're an entrepreneur, leader, or developing your vision, you'll find wisdom and insights you can utilize right now. Welcome your host, Gail Kraft. Got it. Got it. Hello, everybody. This is Gail Kraft from the Empowering Process podcast. And with me, I have a guest that is David Dorier. Did I say that yep. correct? Yep, that's right. Dorier. Dorier. Okay. So um, David is going to share his story with us, and he's going to talk about what it's like growing up with a mother who is a narcissist. And here's why this is very interesting. I've had many conversations with people who have had an, it, a rather traumatic upbringing and end up marrying narcissists and then realizing what happens with their self-esteem, what happens with their belief system of their capability. You are the first person who's going to share what it's like being that child, what it's like to be under that cloud, trying to grow up and trying to get nurtured. So David, thank you so much for sharing your story and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Gail, for having me here. I'm grateful that we found each other and I'm able to tell this story and share it to others and see if there's some some tidbits that people can extract from my story and maybe help them out. Right. So um, so talk about the first time I think you might have realized that your mother's different than the others. Well, that's a great question. Uh, you, you, uh, that's a great question. So I guess the first time was back in the 80s. I had just divorced my first wife. I'm on my third and last wife. But I just after I divorced my first wife, I was at a point, I was living in California. My mother at that time was in Florida. I'm originally from New York. And my father had passed away already. And uh, I, I, I was opening up to my mother on the phone. I was, uh, uh, that was the first time in my life that I ever, felt this way, that I was just open and vulnerable and crying on the phone to her and expressing my feeling. I had never done that. As a child, I was always quiet. Now, I'll get to the, the when I discovered the narcissistic point. I didn't know that at this point. But uh, as I was continuing to express and open and feeling vulnerable and crying, the conversation always went back to my mother. It always went back to her talking about herself or about something that was going on. There was never any any discussion about me or empathy for me or or asking questions of what I was going through and so on and so forth. Nothing. And so at that point, I didn't know the word narcissism at that point, but I knew that something was different. Something wasn't quite right. So to answer your question, that was the first time, and that was back in the mid '80s after I divorced my first wife. So, growing up as a child under the umbrella of a mother who is incapable of nurturing, mm -hmm. right? Um, how did you get that kind of feedback that a child needs, or did yeah. you? Well, you know, there's so much that I've learned since then through therapy and so on and so forth. You know, at the time as a child, I didn't recognize uh, I didn't recognize a lot of things. But there was one traumatic incident that occurred when I was about eight or so years old, eight or nine, maybe years old. When I think about my life prior to this incident with my mother, all I just really don't have many memories other than they must have all been positive that I was a happy go lucky kid and and I that's 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 just my assumption I really don't have 
much memory prior to that. But there was this one incident where, which kind of started the ball rolling in my self con in my um, the way that I viewed myself and my self consciousness and uh, my my um, feeling good about myself was I was out. Uh, it must have been during the summer. I was out playing with some kids and and then one of the kids that I was with started picking on me. And one of the older kids started picking on me as well. And whatever they were saying got me to the point of running away and crying. I ran to my mother. I can still see it to this day. I'm standing in my bedroom. My mother is at the doorway. I'm crying to her uncontrollably, looking for support and love and compassion from her. And there was absolutely nothing. And at that point, my life changed where I thought of my, I then became the kid that was picked on at school. I didn't ha have uh, my self-confidence was just completely gone at that point. Now, it was because of therapy now as an adult that I was able to look back at that incident and kind of, and kind of, kind of put two and two together and think of that that was the thing, the catalyst that kind of got the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a kid, I never talked. I, 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 that's still something that's difficult now, even in my marriage of just, I need to talk, I need to get it out. But I, I, I always had a fear of, I just don't, because I, in my family, I was the oldest of five kids that I was picked on by my siblings, that if I felt that I could not come home and express something positive that happened at school, because I would be picked on by my siblings. I couldn't make a mistake because I would be picked on by my siblings. So I just didn't talk to anybody. I spoke to my brother a couple of years ago and we were starting to have a heart to heart. And he was saying that, uh, that we never knew what was going on with you. You never talked. You just seemed so depressed. And that was the first time I, I heard his perception of me. So um, so that's kind of what was going on as a child. Right. So um, what's interesting is, so as a child, you don't know what's normal or not normal. You think your life is how everybody's life is, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you don't draw those conclusions, but you, your body and your emotions know something's wrong. You know that you're looking for something, especially that time where you absolutely needed empathy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there were probably times beforehand, but this one was traumatic enough that you needed it that badly. And and the opposite was so clear um, that it anchored it anchored in, right? And so you're 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 now quiet as self preservation, right? Um, you believe that you're probably going to be wrong no matter what you do <laughs> you're going to be picked on by somebody no matter what you do and you go through school and you enter life so talk mm -hmm. a little bit about your choices you made because you came from a place of um not self-worth being low yeah. yeah good question uh you know thinking back on it, I think that the, the choices that I made were always safe ones. I did audition for a play because I, I had a teacher, an English teacher. We were reading a, a play in the classroom and everybody was taking turns of reading different characters. And I was reading one of the characters. I think it was Marty was the play. Oh. And she recognized something in me and brought me down to the drama teacher, and I auditioned for a play. I I made I was an understudy, not really understanding what an understudy was. I think it was a day before the opening of the play. Somebody said, "Well, did you learn your line?" Uh, no. Well, what happens if the guy gets sick? Oh my God! <laughs> this panic came over me. So that was really the one time that I I put myself out there. But so much self consciousness, I ended up being the curtain guy running the curtain and always afraid that I was going to make a mistake. I was going to too too soon or put it or close it too, too soon or too late or whatever. And um, so 
when I made my choices, they were always safe choices. But I want I want to go back to recognizing that something was missing. I think subconsciously I knew something was missing. I remember when my grandfather passed away, my mother's father. I was still young, maybe 11 or 12. And I was the only one of the kids that went to the funeral home. And my aunt, my my mother's brother's wife, she saw that I was crying and she came over and consoled me and gave me a hug and put her arms around me. And I, this wave, I can still feel it to this day, this wave of, of love just ran through me. She brought me to the back when we went outside into the lobby area and she sat with me for a few minutes and talked to me for a few minutes. At that point, I wanted to marry her. I was just, it's just that, that, that love, something that I just hadn't experienced before. And uh, she has since passed, but I did tell her, I have been able to tell her that story. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I guess subconsciously, I was searching for something. Well, let me say this. I was always searching for something, but I never knew what it was. And and if I had found it, I didn't even know if I, I, I would know that I found it. So right. I was we don't know what we for, don't know. Right. 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 Exactly. You know, I did many friends. You know, why, why do, why do all the stupid boys in the school have all the girlfriends? And I'm a nice guy. I wasn't a bad looking guy, but I didn't think I was that. I didn't, you know, subcon or my uh, self-confidence. Uh, so maybe people will pick up on it. I never had a girlfriend or really any intimate friends of any sort and always wonder why do they, these idiots have girlfriends and I'm a nice guy. Why can't I have a girlfriend? <laughs> and um so i love the fact that you were searching for something and i think for many people many of the listeners right they they're searching for something and they don't know i mean you ha i so, and i can only speak from my own experience right there's this emptiness and you know there's an emptiness but you don't know how to fill it well, right yeah Right. Yeah. Um, and and of course, years later, you realize you have to fill it yourself and then what you're looking for comes to you. But when mm -hmm. you don't know what you don't know, then how can you take the appropriate action? And mm -hmm. so we go through life experiencing things from a perception um, of of not being worthy. Right. A perception of um well, you know, this probably won't work out anyway, right? <laughs> but, you know, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, self-fulfilling prophecy, it doesn't work. So um, talk about how you chose your first marriage and then your second su subsequent marriage and why they didn't work out. Okay. Well, the first marriage occurred I, I after high school. I, I joined the military. I went into the Air Force. And my second assignment was Korea. And I went there because I, I knew what the I knew what the atmosphere was like, that there were a lot of women that were looking to marry American GIs. And I went there specifically to get married. I, I had really well, not re I had no experience with women up to that point. And now I'm in an I'm in a a situation where off base there are all these bars filled with women that are looking for a relationship with an american gi and eventually to get married and i figured in my mind that no matter who it's going to be just like the movies and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be uh with a home with a white picket fence not knowing not only in a normal relationship with with an american woman you know, that takes work, which I learned later. But, you know, here I had additional responsibilities. She did speak English very well. Uh, that was one thing that attracted me to her. And she also was very westernized, had never been to the States before. Um, but when I got to the States with her, I immediately, my whole body broke out in hives. Uh, I, I, it was just this responsibility of it just hit me like a wave that I and when we we're living in Korea, it was fairly easy because 
we were traveling around. She was my guide. We were going this place and that place. And it was, uh, it, it was somewhat easy, but now in the States here, I have someone who's a hundred, 110% reliant on me for their well being, teaching them how to drive and shop and uh, everything. And I, I could barely do, do all of these things for, for me. And now I've got to help somebody else. I mean, I literally head to toe broke out in hives at and at our first base. We went to Homestead, Florida. So you asked the question about how did I get into that relationship? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And we were in that. We stayed in that relationship for seven years. Uh, we didn't have any children. And uh, I feel grateful for that. And uh, it may be divorce a lot easier. Yes. And so um, what did you learn from that? And then what happened with the subsequent relationship? Yeah. So what I learned from that, I, I, I'm not sure if this was the first relationship or second, that there needs to be communication. Uh, and, I, and even in my second relationship, I, 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 there was no communication. There was nothing. However, the second woman that I married, I didn't realize it at the time. It wasn't until after the marriage was over that she was my mother's twin. We During that time, again, it was another seven years married in, in that second marriage, uh, living here in Georgia, my mother and her now husband, Walter, who's a saint, love Walter, and that we, we spent a lot of time together. We were traveling down to Florida. They were traveling up here. We were spending a lot of time together with my mother and Walter. I thought it was great because as a kid, I was always looking for that recognition and wanting to get close to my mother and still not seeing things. I, I wasn't seeing, there was still, the there was judgment was the glue in the family. There was a lot of things I didn't realize at the time. I didn't realize how my siblings were judging me. I didn't realize that my siblings had seen all of these narcissistic things with my mother. I never saw it. I... And during the time that I was married to my second wife, it occurred to me at some point that I probably was going to end up divorcing her. It just wasn't, it just didn't have anything. There was nothing there. That we weren't talking. But in the back of my mind, I was telling myself, if when I divorce my wife, my mother is going to divorce me. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because she found um, a kindred spirit. And, you know, it's interesting that you brought up um, judgment because what I have learned about myself and my past relationships, a lot of my relationships were based on gossip and judgment and um, fear, right? Because that's how you feel safe, right? You, you create this like it's you, not me. I'm fine. You, not me. Um, and when I started doing the work on owning my own stuff, <laughs> let's just put it that way, right? Facing myself in the mirror and going, yeah, no, maybe it's you, Gail. Maybe, maybe it is you. Um, I got clarity about the type of life I was living, right? And so when, so at some point you realize that divorcing your wife meant divorcing your mother, but when did you get clarity as to what it is that you need in your life and mm -hmm. then sought help? Um, okay, good question. So uh, a year after divorcing my second, I met my now wife, uh, Donna, and it, I, I after, after divorcing my second, there, there was a difference in my relationship with my mother, even before Donna came into my life. They're just... I couldn't put my finger on it, what it was, but there definitely was a difference in the relationship. And I should say that my ex-wife was spending a lot of time with my mother. My, matter of fact, the day that I moved out of the house and into my apartment, 
my ex-wife was down there with my mother. And to make a long story short with them, she was even at my mother's funeral. And I didn't realize you know, how close they were and how much time they spent together. So when did I realize that something was wrong? Or, or when did I realize not something was wrong? When did I realize when the light bulb went off? <clears throat> it um, it occurred in early on in my relationship with now, my now wife. We we went down to visit my mother, and as soon as I walked in the door, I feel very different in the house. When my ex wife and I would go there, my mother would be at the door. We would get a big hug and wow, wow, wow. How was the trip, this thing and everything else. However, when I showed up that first time with Donna, my mother was not at the door. Walter was at the door and my mother was in the kitchen peering around, peering around the wall and looking at her face. I I just, I, I don't know at the time, I don't know what it was, but I, I, there was something. My wife being the outsider she immediately could see what my mother was all about. I couldn't <laughs> see it. All I was trying to do was figure out what's going on here. What am I doing wrong? There what you we, go. Mm -hmm. What are we doing wrong? Mm -hmm. What can I do to fix this? I don't even know what needs to be fixed, but something's wrong here. Something's not right. Well, fast forward a couple of years and my, my wife and I were in visiting my uncle my my mother's younger brother and he says your mother called the other day and you know she knew that we were gonna we were going to tucson to visit them and your mother said said um you know that donna was going to be there and then my, my mother said well good luck nobody likes her my mother's saying that about my wife and my uncle followed that up with, well, knowing that she doesn't like her, we know that we'll love her. And it was when my uncle said that, good luck, nobody can stand her, that that's when the light bulb went off. It's not me. That's the problem. It's my mother. And a day or so later, I called my mother, not to confront her, it was also around New Year's, to wish Happy New Year. And she was asking how the trip was going. I said, man, we're having a great time uh, with Uncle John and Arlene and all of the siblings and cousins and this, that, and everything else. Everybody, we, everybody just showing how much love that we were getting. Uh, and we were getting all this love from them, even though, and I, here's what I said, even though they heard all these horrible things about Donna, even before the word Donna was finished coming out of my mouth, her response was, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> and at that point, uh, I, I knew, I, she knew that I, I caught her with her pants down. I didn't confront her. I didn't say, why did you do this? Why did you do that? You said this. I didn't do any of that. Uh, but what happens next is what, what I've learned, what narcissists do, they now protect themselves. The venom is now cranked up to an 11. There's, uh, she didn't, she, uh, uh, until she died, which was probably 10 or so years later, she never talked to her brother again. She blamed her brother for destroying the relationship between me and my mother. Which was never existed to begin with. It wasn't, well, it, 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 yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, she never talked to him until she was on her deathbed. And I'm not sure if she called him or he called her or my sister called him. I don't know how that worked, but I know that they talked when she was on an hour or so before she died. Yeah. And so, um, so the process of, okay, now in order to heal, and I hate using the word heal because, you know, I'm so beyond that now, but 
you need to forgive her, forgive yourself, and move on with your life. How did you get that done? Yeah. Well, there was counseling. And let me also back up. When I was a teenager, one of the things you were talking about of how do you fill that hole of that's something and the way that I filled that hole was drugs hmm. and started that before I went into the service. Marijuana was my drug of choice. Yes. So, so that, I don't, um, yes. So that happened. And then in, certainly going into the military, I went in the military in the late seventies, right after the Vietnam war. So after basic training and my schooling and all of that, my first day um, at my first assignment in Guam, I was stoned because I was greeted at the door with a with a joint, and uh, it, not saying that it was it 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 was it was, certainly wasn't legal. However, the police and so on on the base they were looking for folks that were doing much harder drugs. So as long as you weren't stupid about marijuana, nobody was going to mess with you. Right. But it became part of my life up till just about a, a year and a half ago when I went for um, rehab. However, so what happened after that phone call with my mother? Um, so I, I, I started counseling uh, shortly after that. And when I went into, went into the counselor, the first things I said to him was, I want to be happy and I want to stop smoking. I didn't smoke cigarettes, but just the marijuana. So for five or six years, I worked with him, and most of it we spent working through my mother. And that's when a lot of the discoveries, that incident that happened when I was eight years old, reaching out mm -hmm. to my mother, nothing there. Uh, also, uh, while I was with him is when she passed away uh, several years into our, our therapy. But I guess one thing that you said was about uh, forgiveness. I, I didn't really understand what forgiveness was. I felt at first that forgiveness meant that that I, I, for, I that I had to forgive you for what you did to me. That's the way I was thinking about it. I had been a part of a men's group for a number of years, and then one of the gentlemen in the men's group, that's when the light bulb went off. It's not forgiving them. It's forgiving myself that at the time, all I, I I was applying I in my relationship with my mother and and things I may have done wrong and so on and so forth I was doing the best I could at that time with the resources that I had yes and so I need to forgive myself and say I did the best I could and I forgive myself for not because I didn't because I, I didn't know I didn't know what to do better. If I had the resources back then, back then I would have used them, but I didn't. I didn't know, but I did the best I could and I need to forgive myself for that. And that's where that forgiveness came in. It really is. Forgiveness is more about giving yourself grace, right? Um, so that you can move on with your life and leaving that history in the history books, and not carrying it with you and making it a present phenomenon anymore. Um, I I went a little bit further myself. I I did um, a form of forgiveness um, with this ca caveat. So you know, mine was both parents. You know, different different things. But with my father um, and my mother too. You know, given your upbringing, given the situation that you were in, and the tools that you had, right. This is, you did the best you knew how. It wasn't the right way for me, but it was the best you knew how at the time. So I forgive you for not knowing. It's like Christ on the, on, on the, on the cross. Forgive them. They, they know not what they do. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's almost that kind of thing. And it's not condoning. Right. It is just saying, you didn't know any better. You mm -hmm. thought you were doing the best that you could. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't good enough for me, but I'm not carrying that load anymore. I'm leaving it with you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
So yeah. it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So now you're in an amazing relationship. And what do you do now because of these lessons that you've learned? What has this done, this change of who you are? What has this done for your life? You're not quiet well, anymore. Well, I, I my luckily, I've, I've got a beautiful wife who is not afraid to kick me in the ass <laughs> to get me to start talking. It's very easy for me to stay in my head I still have fears around opening up, being vulnerable at times, mm -hmm. but she, she, she does bring it out of me. And yes, definitely. I've gotten better. There's no, there's no doubt about it that I have gotten better of just, yeah. In, in the past, I, I wouldn't talk at all because if I, if I talk, then that's going to start a conversation and then I've got to be engaged. And, you know, it's interesting my career today is helping people be better public speakers. I, I am great at coaching other people to be better public speakers. And my wife will many times will, 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 will say, you coach people on how to be a better public speaker and you can't talk. Uh, it's, and, and I found myself in career fields that have put me up in front of people on a regular basis have really tested my self-confidence. I was in radio broadcasting for a number of years. I did theater for a number of years. I became a trainer with the Air Force and with a number of uh, corporations. I'm not trying to sell people here uh, at all. It's just that how, how the universe has put me into these types of roles. And I love it. I love being in front of people, training them. Because as many introverts, uh, I certainly put myself in that category, that we are more comfortable on a stage in front of people than we are with small talk. So I'm not right, sure because you know the you know the subject, you mm. know your expertise, right? right. Um, and you you know that you're sharing something that you're very that you know really well. Right. right. Um, it's when so. I could actually, you could put me on stage and you can say, Gail, talk about life inside a ping pong ball and I can make it happen, <laughs> right? I can, I can, and make it engaging and make everybody believe the story I'm telling, mm -hmm. right? And it, and it's something that I never aspired to until I was thrown into that situation, right? right? And so, um, and so when did you realize that you could, do this thing like the first time that you were put into that situation what happened that like oh i have to speak here and i can do this thing um well the first thing i started radio broadcasting back in the early 80s when i was still on guam i had always had ever since i was a kid i'd always had a fascination with radio i wanted to get into radio i had no idea how it was going to happen and all of a sudden whammo i'm on the air for the first time, and to answer your question, I just felt comfortable, not with the speaking part. I had voices in my head telling me I was no good. Mm -hmm. I need to give this up. I could I could hear myself in the headphones and envision someone in their car, somewhere driving on Guam, a doctor, lawyer kind of person, pointing at the radio and saying, this guy is an idiot. That was going through my head. However, the mechanics of radio back in the early 80s, it was it was very labor intensive with the board and knobs and everything else. But I just felt comfortable. I always knew what I had to do. We had turntables, records and cart machines for commercials and so on. Logistically, it was it was easy for me logistically. And I knew this is what I wanted to do. I, I then ended up getting out of the service after 10 years. I went into the reserves, thank goodness, and then pursued radio full time for 12 years. But one of the things I didn't realize in radio, because you're so protected, you're in your, you're in your little room protected. But then it was shortly after I started working full time that they said, hey, Dave, you're going to be the guy that's going to go down to the local car dealership and you're going to do the live broadcasts from there unbelievable in front of people 
I was scared to death, but something happened. It was like an out of body experience. It was like I was, I could see myself on the stage. I was observing myself on the stage. Like, who the heck is that guy? Where is all of this coming from? It was an out of body experience. Isn't it and, amazing? Mm -hmm. It felt mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. it you was, know, it was, it was better than getting high. Yeah, it, well, this is what happens. So I, I have a, a training that I do and a keynote on crafting the flow formula and getting yourself into flow and thereby how to get your team into flow. You're not going to get your team into flow if you're not. It's just not going to happen. You have to get into flow first, right? And when you're there, that out of body experience that you're talking about is what happens. And mm. creativity, like, like, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I am interviewing or if I'm with a client, I will get this inspiration to tell a story or to say something. And the person I'm with will go, well, funny you should say that i was thinking of that this morning it's not funny i was i'm in flow and in flow is when your intuitive ability skyrockets and you have no idea what comes out of your mouth but it's it's gold always yeah. gold so you were so <laughs> so you saw that you not only did you have an out of body experience it was awesome it felt you know I will say better than sex. It felt amazing. Mm -hmm. What did you do to capture that again and again and again? Well, I think what, what ended up happening is just getting more and more comfortable mm -hmm. being in front of people, developing a shtick, uh, doing some of these live remotes. It kind of followed a, a similar format um yes getting more comfortable behind the microphone building my confidence yes those voices were there it was during that time that i also started in theater community theater mm -hmm. so that got me up on stage uh, learning lines and crafting uh, developing a character still those voices were there it wasn't it wasn't the character on stage for quite some time it it was david on stage with all of my insecurities and all of my voices and all I was doing was it was mechanical. I was just listening for my key, the key word that would trigger me to make, to mechanically say my line. It was just mechanical. Right. So, but at some point it changed where I became the character and did more listening and learning more about the craft and quieted those voices. Those voices are were 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 still there, but they were a lot quieter. Right. The and voices, those, well, they yeah. do go. I don't want to say ne they never go. They do eventually go. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, when you're on stage, and um, so I've done a little bit of acting in my time, and and I always got into character. Mm -hmm. I, the second that curtain went up, Gail mm -hmm. was left somewhere. Mm -hmm. And whoever the character was, um, and the beauty about that, first of all, you can be anything. I mean, what a beautiful, I mean, next time, God, I want to come back as an actress. What an amazing thing to be able to play all of these archetypes, mm -hmm. right, um, to the the highest degree mm -hmm. and, and just have fun with it and mold it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you can also heal yourself mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. playing a character. Yeah. 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 Yes. So, um, so amazing. So now, so you teach people how to be on stage. You teach people how to use their voice. Um, you teach people how not to be afraid of the, the, the those little voices in the back of their head. Mm -hmm. And if someone wanted to know more about you, Dave, and someone to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, there's a couple of ways to find me. One is my website, presentyourwaytosuccess.com. Another was, is to look for me on LinkedIn. I am hosting every day presentation skills tips. 
and uh, definitely reach out and connect with me. And once you find my website, you'll find a number of different buttons on there that all lead to the same place. You can set up a free complimentary 30-minute coaching session with me, pick my brain on presentation skills, and uh, if you feel that you'd like to take it to a next step, we can talk about that. Uh, one of the things I uh, throw in here that led me to this is eventually the Air Force, the Air Force Reserves noticed that, you know, for 28 years, I was in the same career field and they noticed I was doing some impromptu training in my unit and then said, you know, we, we uh, uh, there's a Dobbins Air Force Base in Georgia is looking for an instructor for folks coming into our career field. Would you like to go? This was in the mid 90s. So that's when I started my 30 year career in training and development. So, you know, all of these careers, putting me in front of people, radio broadcasting, theater, and then training. Yes, I had to learn a lot along the way of quieting those voices, how to engage an audience. And those are the things that I love sharing with others. Right. And honestly, those skill sets, you don't have to be on stage. If you are in business and you're in a meeting, you have to stand up and write. If you even if you're in a one to one with your with your senior leader and you have to present, why do I deserve a raise today? Right. You still have to have those communication skills. Right. Yeah. So, guys, get in touch with Dave if you want to just up your game a little bit. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your story with me. This thank is, you. it's an amazing story. Thank you, and Gail. You're welcome. And thank you, everybody, from the Empowering Process podcast for listening to us. If this story inspired you or raised a question, put it in the comments. We would love to get back to you. If you know someone who could benefit from this story, share it out to them. As always, do subscribe so you hear more about when these episodes come up. Share it, like it, thumbs up. We love to hear from you. We love you. We want to know that you hear us. Thank you so much, David. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Empowering Process Podcast. Be sure to visit Gail at gailcraft.com to learn more about how she serves thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and goal seekers. And remember, if you like this broadcast, be sure to share and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.